Welcome to the Westside Investors Network. Win your community of investing knowledge for growth. This is the Real Estate Professionals Investing Podcast for real estate professionals by real estate professionals. This show is focused on the next step in your career, investing. Thank you for listening. And please, if you like our content, rate us on your podcast provider. Just a quick disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are for educational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any shares or securities, make or consider any investments or take any other action. Welcome back to another episode of the Deal Deep Dive segment on the West Side Investors Network podcast. I'm your host, Trent Werner. In this segment, our featured guests will share their unique stories on a specific deal they've invested in. We will dive deep into finding the deal, financing the deal, writing an offer, and the due diligence. Do us a solid and smash that subscribe button, leave us a rating, and share this episode. And now, let's dive deep. All right. Welcome back to the Deal Deep Dive segment of the West Side Investors Network podcast. I'm Trent Werner, and today we are joined by John Kasman with Kasman Capital Group. We'll be talking a little bit about his journey how he got to syndicate and investing in over $100 million worth of apartment complexes and multifamily real estate. John, thanks for joining us and welcome to the show. Hey, Trent. Thank you for having me, man. I'm excited to be here today and talk to all your listeners. Awesome. So John, tell us about Kasman Capital Group and how you started Kasman Capital Group. Yeah. So Kasman Capital Group invests in apartments, primarily in the Midwest and growing parts of the Southeast region. And, you know, it really started because I was investing in real estate and I faced a challenge that I'm sure many investors face, which is you buy a property, you run out of money, right? You save up your money, you buy a property, and now you don't have money in your bank account to go buy another one. Now, some people are blessed and fortunate to have that. But, you know, as investors who were bootstrapping it, you know, we kind of had to stop looking at properties until we could save up money. So I started to look for a solution. And as I was looking for a solution, a lot of the folks around me were very interested in what we were doing investing. After a while, I finally realized that, well, maybe we can partner with them. And you know that way we have access to more capital, we can find more deals, we don't have to keep stopping. And eventually from that idea, Casman Capital Group was born. And as you alluded to, we've invested in over $125 million worth of apartments and continue to grow. Awesome. And I know before we dive headfirst into the deals that we're going to be talking about today and kind of the process or your journey, I know you were in corporate America prior to starting Casman Capital Group. Were you investing in real estate while you were in corporate America? I was. And I think it's a great way for anybody to get started, you know, to understand kind of the journey. I mean, I was at General Motors. I was in Detroit back in 2007, 2008, 2009. I worked there from 2007 to 2011. And if you recall that time frame, General Motors went bankrupt at that time, right? So I was there when we went through bankruptcy. And the thing that kept happening is I watched rounds and rounds of layoffs. And I felt like we just lived in anxiety, waiting for the other shoe to drop. And it was a tough environment to be in. We're certainly resilient and it all worked out in the end. But the thing that stood out to me was we couldn't really rely on this one income or this W-2 job. And yes, I could go get another job and all that. But it just made me realize that you can work for a big company, small company at any moment. You may fall out of favor from someone else who's you know power to be, and you're out there scrambling, trying to look for employment. I know a lot of folks listening here, especially on the West Coast, understand exactly what I'm talking about in the tech industry right now. So going through that experience made me think back to the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I read some years earlier. It really solidified this belief that I had to find some passive income or some other way to make money. And I wasn't savvy enough to build my own app or anything like that. But real estate seemed pretty easy to... Well, not easy. Real estate seemed common enough that enough people were doing it and plentiful enough that I felt I could figure it out and be okay at it. So that's what sparked me down that path while I was working a W-2 job, creating a little bit of passive income, and then ultimately moving to the point where I could go full-time into it. I want to disagree with something you said. You said real estate's not easy. I think that's correct. Real estate, the blueprint is easy. The process and the journey can be easy or simple, I should say. Simple. Yeah. But it's simple, not, not easy. easy. Yeah. Simple, yeah. not easy. Yeah. yeah. And if you're disciplined yeah. and you stick to the blueprint, I mean, yeah. anyone can do it. That's the cool thing about real estate. As long as yeah. you understand the blueprint, it's a simple concept, but it's not easy. Yeah. So now that you know you went from corporate America, started investing, developing, or building some passive income for yourself and your family, 
when did you hit that point when you said, okay, I know I can go full time with this? Was it during that kind of duplex, triplex, eight unit era, or was it later than that? There was a transition right after the eight unit where, so just to give context, the first investment we made was a duplex in Chicago, house hacked to live in one unit, rented out the other. About a, probably about two years later, we bought a second property, which was a three unit. And this was a pure investment property. And then about another year, year and a half after that, we pulled out some of the equity from the first property and put that together with savings to invest in an eight unit building. And right around that time is when I realized that, okay, this is working and this could be the pathway for the future. I kind of always knew it could be a pathway, but at that point it felt real and we had some momentum. I'm like, okay, how do I double down on this and make this the future? Ironically, I started investing in real estate because I was concerned about my job security and losing a job and you know being at GM at that time. And the company I was working for actually <laughs> went through bankruptcy. You know, I was fine. You know, I never missed a paycheck. You know, I did great. But this is the second time now. So at that point, that just got accelerated. I'm like, all right, I need to double down. Like, what do I really need to do to make this happen? And ultimately, I hired a mentor and a coach who can help me learn more about structuring deals and raising capital and all that kind of stuff. And that's what led me into the space to really accelerate it and grow it. And then ultimately make that full-time transition. So it sounds like the eight unit property was that stepping stone or that building block that you were looking for. Just briefly, Absolutely. you know, was that deal in Cincinnati? Was it in, you know, out of state? What were some of the metrics on that? Yeah. So I was living in Chicago at the time. So all those, the first three deals, everything we did up until we got into syndication was all in Chicago. So this was an eight unit. And what happened was the two unit was in a neighborhood called North Center, if anybody's familiar, basically a really nice part of town. Every data point I looked at said, this was a great neighborhood. It was the only neighborhood out of 77 distinct Chicago neighborhoods. It was the only one that did not lose any value during the economic downturn. Right. So that to me alone was like, huh, I don't know anything else about it, but <laughs> if it could survive that, it's probably good enough to be fine for the next five to 10 years. So that was our first one. The second property was a neighborhood called Avondale, which is next to Logan Square. Logan Square is an up and coming, very popular area. A lot of young people, kind of hipster area. Avenue was right next to it. So it had a lot of the characteristics, but it was more affordable. So we invested there and that did really well. Every time we made an investment, the economy, the market, everything was getting better and better. So our returns were getting worse and worse because people were willing to pay more for these properties. So when we underwrote them, they didn't look as good. So the eight unit was a little further away than where we were at with the other properties. And as you mentioned, it was a stepping stone because we kind of had started this thesis with the two properties and okay, we believe we can make money in real estate. The eight unit was the first commercial deal. So that was getting us out of the residential space and moving into commercial. We hired a property management company for the eight unit. So I needed to have experience managing the manager. I managed the two unit and the three unit myself, me and my wife did. So now we had to relinquish control and actually be asset managers and work with a property manager. And it also kind of allowed us to kind of oversee a real renovation, which we hadn't done up to that point. So we renovated our unit and the two unit, but we were moving into that unit. We hadn't really went in and said, okay, hey, this property, we're going to renovate half the units. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. So this is the first time we were doing anything along those lines. And it was definitely a learning experience because one of the mistakes that we made is we tried to use cash flow to manage the renovations. And the challenge for that was, especially starting out, we had issues pop up that we weren't expecting. I remember when we were buying the property, the owner, I was very nice. He walked with it and told us where the issues were, told us which tenants we need to pay attention to. And he said, hey, this one lady, she makes up an excuse every month not to pay rent, man. Like she once told me there was a ghost in her apartment and she couldn't pay because of the ghost. And I'm sitting here like, either he's hilarious, has a great sense of humor, or this lady is going to be a headache. Well, he did not have that great of a sense of humor. And this lady was absolutely a headache. And she would file all sorts of claims and you know come up with stuff. I actually never saw her apartment the whole time she lived there because she refused to give us access. And she ended up not paying rent. We had to go through an eviction process. And then she said that her unit had mold. Now keep in mind, we've never been able to access the unit. So I have no idea what's in that, that unit. So sure enough, she took some pictures and there was some mold, but she never reported it, never let us see it. And then she did some other stuff. She called the city on us for different things. 
but it cost us a lot of money. So she was just one example of things that we had to deal with. There was another lady who had eight pets in a one bedroom unit and wow. had no idea. This had all sorts of pets, man. I'm like, she had a farm going on in her apartment. And uh, of course, all those pets, well, they got to use the bathroom somewhere. And she wasn't creating the environment where it was natural. So that wood was smelly and rotten out. So we had to replace the wood floor in there. So stuff like that, that popped up that we didn't plan for, we didn't budget for. So we never got around to actually having money to renovate the units to make them nice and get the rents that we wanted, because we were trying to just put out fires left and right. So we ended up selling that one for, you know, really, I mean, we, we made some money on paper, but really when you look into holding costs and broker fees and all that, we didn't make much money at all. We could have held on to it and did well, but I think we realized that we were taking the step we needed to take with that stepping stone. We learned some lessons and it would have been so much more work and energy to try to continue to turn that thing around or get it to where we wanted it to be versus let's take the lesson and let's move on to a new project. So that's what we ended up doing. And now, here's a word from our sponsor. Get things done while you're on the move. Learn more about working with a virtual assistant through off-site professionals. It's a great way to get all the things done that you need to get done. Have freedom in your time and streamline your life by automating your business. Stop spending time on the tasks that you can delegate and start spending more time on your superpower. Call us today at 503 503- 446-3177 or visit our website at offsiteprofessionals.com. Uptown Syndication is now offering a syndication coaching program for you to take your real estate portfolio to the next level. This is your opportunity to have experienced syndicators, AJ and Chris Shepard, coach you on your way to controlling your real estate investing future. Our coaching program will provide you with the tools and framework needed to begin syndicating real estate in your target market. Go to uptownsyndication.com today to learn more. What I was going to say is with that property, the lessons itself were worth more than any of the proceeds or profits that may have been made on paper. But getting your first experience with commercial financing, learning the asset management processes and going through that phase, as well as kind of, I guess, learning the idea of when we buy a property, what is our construction budget or capital budget or CapEx budget going into it? Is yeah, you're going to have the fires that pop up, but you know that's one thing that I've learned is when you acquire a property, you got to set money aside for capital projects because you know that if you don't and try to pay for them out of monthly rents and revenue, none of the capital expenditures are going to get done and projects are going to get done. So I think you learned a few valuable lessons with that, you know, that stepping stone from the eight unit. It sounds like you kind of understood the process well enough to then go in and build what you've built today. From there, what was the journey like? Would you just you know, start general partnering 100 unit deals or were there smaller deals along the way? Yeah, great question. So the next deal we did was actually 192 units and we were general partners, but we were not the lead operator. And that was actually a perfect scenario where we could lean on someone else who had a lot of experience we could add some value. We could bring some of the experience we had to the table, but we weren't the main one, you know, driving the ship. You know, we could be there, we can assist, we can help, and we can learn and we can grow. So we did that. That worked out really well. The next thing we did was a 20 unit where we were the lead. We did a JV deal with another investor, and that ended up working out well. We had some more learning pains and whatnot on that deal. And I would just say that what was really important for us was recognizing how important it is to have the right team. You know, this is a people business and you hear people say it all the time, but what that means is you have to have the right people in place. You have to understand what they're looking for. You have to give them resources and tools to be successful, but you've got to network. You've got to communicate with people and you have to understand what it takes to be successful. You know, for us, we started out in that 28 unit. Well, that wasn't in our backyard. We were still in Chicago. That property was here in Cincinnati. And we knew we'd be moving to Cincinnati at some point. So we felt comfortable making the investment, but we were still out of town. So I was networking with a lot of people here in the market. And, you know, we ended up having to change property management companies. We ended up having to fire. We actually ended up having to sue our contractor. He ended up going to jail for some stuff. We had to change that person a couple of times. We ran into a bunch of things, right? And I don't say that to scare anyone. The important thing here is to understand that we had to refine our processes. And that was something that we had to step back and say, okay, how do we vet a contractor? How do we vet a property manager? It's not just enough to ask a handful of people, get some referrals, 
talk to them on the phone and pick one. Like we want to make sure that this person has the experience and the track record to execute on our particular business plan. And when I think about that eight unit, the 28 unit, even did some flip projects that didn't pan out. The great thing about having those quote unquote failures, and the 28 unit wasn't a failure, but the great thing about those things is you get to learn, you know, and you get to get some real lessons, some business lessons. And the big thing for all of them was making sure you get the right people. A lot of times what investors do is they're price conscious. So if you're looking at a contractor, you're looking at bids for anything, you get a bathroom model, whatever it is, maybe you talk to a couple people, you know, one guy's at 5,000, someone else is at 8,000, someone else is at 9,000. But that 5,000 bid looks really good, right? $4,000 less, $3,000 less than the comp. Great, let's go with him. What ends up happening most of the time though, is that $5,000 person gets in there and they either realize they didn't budget for something, they didn't account for something, or they were so eager to get the project in that they're not going to be profitable or they're not going to be able to do it the way they thought they were going to do it. So it's either going to take longer or it's going to end up costing you more money in the end. So our belief is get the right people. If you have the right people, they will be able to figure out how to save money. And you can go to that $9,000 contractor and say, hey, listen, I know you're at 9000 Where can I save? I'm not asking you to reduce your fee. I'm asking you to help me make different decisions so I could get this cost down. And they're usually knowledgeable enough to say, well, hey, maybe you want to change the material from this to that. Or maybe if we did this this way, you could save $1,000. Or you know what? Hey, I've got another project that's wrapping up in three weeks. If you can wait a little bit, I might be able to take some of the, you know, some of the tools or some of the things from that project that we don't use and I can bring it over here. But if you can get the right people, they're going to be, you know, resourceful enough to help you figure out how to save versus just hiring based off of who's the cheapest. I really like what you said there with especially the contractor example, because I'm going through it right now where I made the mistake of trusting someone that was significantly more affordable. And it's just taken, it's cost me time and energy versus just going with the, you know, the kind of mid or, you know, yeah. upper middle bid that I got. But so I think that's really important for people that are going to get into this space, or even if it's on their own projects, when you're doing remodels. You know, get a handful of bids and really talk and ask questions to the people that you're planning on working with because the people that are knowledgeable and experienced are going to pay dividends in the future. John, yeah. when it comes to Casmin Capital, and I know you've JV'd, you've been, you know, co GPs, all that stuff, and, you know, and the GP yourself, what do you think that your strong suit is? Because, you know, there's so many different facets in, you know, syndication. What would you say that you guys are best at when, when you're going to take down a deal? My background is in business. I know a lot of times we talk about it being in marketing, but it's really in business, right? So my job was to, for 15 years, I sat down with companies and brands and strategized on how to help them grow, you know, how to help them grow market share, how to connect with you know an audience, how to sell more products or more widgets. So that business background, I think is very helpful. So when I apply that to real estate and particularly apartment syndications, it's really understanding the business plan. You know, what are we looking to do? Where's the opportunity? Where are the potential risk? Where are the threats? How do we adjust that? It's working with people. So having that professional background allows me to connect with potential investors, connect with brokers, you know, connect with any vendors that we need to partner with and being an orchestrator. So in that role that I had, at one point, I oversaw seven different agency partners in my role. So when you're talking about the ability to work with general contractors, different vendors, working with the property management company, working with the lender, working with your insurance company, like it takes a certain mentality to be able to coordinate all that, not to mention brokers and investors. And there's so many different personality types that you have to be able to answer to. I think sometimes people view this industry as, you know, just a business and an escape, but what I mean by that is to say, like people come into this because they don't want to work nine to five or they don't want to have a boss. I have bad news for you. You come into apartment syndications, you're going to have a boss, right? It may not be somebody over your shoulder watching you punch the clock, but you've got people to answer to. You've got a lot of clients. You've got a lot of bosses. It could be the lender, it could be the property management company, it could be the insurance company, it could be your residence. You know, there are a lot of people you've got to answer to. And ultimately, your job is to be the CEO and make sure everything is moving in the right direction, that you're on track to hit the metrics and performance that you're looking for for your investors, but you're helping everyone assess risk, assess challenges, and get the solutions they need to be successful. So for me, I think just coming from corporate America, coming from you know marketing and working on so many different projects and so many different challenges, so many different industries from you know automotive world to CPG to finance, 
I've worked with a lot of different companies that have a lot of, you know, different challenges, legal challenges, restrictions, you know, time frame, consumer buying decision process. So having that background kind of allows me to be very flexible and just really look at something to evaluate what it is, you know, evaluate what it is to determine what the right solutions could or should be and to lead us through that project. All of which are very important in running a successful syndication and capital group. For Chasm Capital Group, what do you, I know the market's kind of interesting right now. Interest rates are what they are. Everyone's talking about that and, you know, the whole economy as, you know, is it stable where we're going, where we're headed? What do you see for your, you know, your current assets that you're holding and maybe thinking about acquiring like in the next three to five years? What do you see with your portfolio and either trimming it back or growing that? Well, we expect to grow our portfolio and our investing strategy is really, it's a resilient strategy. So we don't try to time the market. We're not necessarily trying to, you know, invest in the hottest markets at the hottest time and, you know, cash out when we can get max value. We believe in some of the fundamentals of real estate, which makes it so attractive, which is what appealed to us in the first place. So we're talking about cash flow. We're talking about upside appreciation potential, and we're talking about mitigating risk with quality assets where there's strong demand. So the Midwest in particular, you don't have the same fluctuations that you get on the coast, right? We don't have the rates jumping up crazy high as far as where cap rates are. Cap rates also don't shoot down crazy low. It's pretty stable here. The people who live here choose to live here. They're usually not chasing a job or chasing a career. They usually grow up or they have some ties to the Midwest. And this is home. They've got family here. They may have you know, married into the family here, but they've got family here and some ties. I think when you get to some of the coastal markets, someone may move to, I'll just pick on Arizona or Seattle. They may move there because they got a great job out there, right? And if that job disappears, well, now they have no ties there. So what are they going to do? They're going to leave and move out. So I think you see that more in those kind of markets, but you don't, you know, the Midwest is pretty consistent. The other thing you see is the rental growth has been really strong in the Midwest over the last year. Eight of the top 10 markets for rental growth are in the Midwest because, again, a lot of these other markets have yo-yoed and now they're actually seeing declines in rent growth, whereas these markets are pretty tried and true when it comes to the Midwest. So for us, we invest for cash flow first and foremost. Cash flow buys you time. It doesn't make you rich. It doesn't make you wealthy, but it allows you to pay the bills, give a return to your investors, and it allows you to control when you exit. And that's really important for us because if the second part of wealth building and investing in apartments is the appreciation potential, we need to sell when it makes sense for us to sell. And the only way we can control that is if we have a cash flowing asset and we have a loan product that gives us flexibility. So that's our strategy. Hasn't really changed. We buy cash flowing products. We look in areas where demand is growing, or at least all the trends that we can indicate demonstrate that they should continue to grow. And then we want to put a loan product on there that gives us some control and flexibility. So those three things, I think, are tried and true strategies. We try to employ those to find the best opportunities for our investors. And when it comes to typical hold time, what are you guys targeting? We tell investors five years, five to seven years is what we shoot for. We've seen everything from two and a half years to five years up to this point. I think most people are anticipating that hold periods will be a little bit longer just because of the market dynamics. So I would say three to seven years is what people can plan on. Okay. So, I mean, that's kind of what we do as well. We're not looking to churn and burn and get them off our books in 18 months. We kind of like that, like you said, the ability and the flexibility to say, hey, we can sell at two and a half or, you know, we can go as far out as seven if it makes sense for the investor's return and the asset itself. Do you see yourself expanding to any? I know you had some comments on the coasts and some of the kind of more volatile markets. Do you see yourself expanding out of the Midwest ever or or just kind of focus on what you know? It's a good question. So we do invest in the Southeast region. We have a little bit of a different strategy there. So I've been fortunate enough to build a ton of great connections and relationships with other operators. And what we'll do in the Southeast is actually partner with other operators we have relationships with. So instead of us kind of, you know, being that lead position as as an operator, we're going to partner with them, let them be the boots on the ground, let them vet the right opportunities. You know, we're going to, you know, trust, but verify the information that they're providing to us, but we'll partner with them that way. That's allowed us to get into markets like Atlanta, Georgia, the Carolinas, Texas, sort of. So we do like that approach, but I think we want to be mindful of kind of focusing on where we're at and what our strengths are and not being spread so thin that we're evaluating every opportunity across the country. I think being really disciplined and focused allows you to spot opportunities that other people may miss 
And we want to make sure that we kind of keep our pencil sharp. In order to do that, we kind of have to have a primary focus and then other strategies to get that diversification and to get outside and into other markets. Very nice. Very nice. Did I miss anything during our conversation today that you wanted to share with our audience? I think the biggest thing is like, you know, if you're trying to win as an investor, it's really important to understand what your investing philosophy is and what your strategy is going to be. You know, the first deal, second deal, you're trying it out. You know, you're going to get your feet wet and you don't want to lose money, obviously, but you got to figure out what you enjoy and what you don't enjoy. And I think one big mistake people make is assuming they have to love real estate. You don't have to love real estate. You just have to love the results and the benefits that real estate provides. And based on your actual passion for real estate, that should decide whether or not you want to be active and be hands-on and lead your own deals, or do you just be a passive investor and get great returns or find good operators that you can trust, right? So what we have done is we've put together a sample deal. And the sample deal is great for both active investors and passive investors so that they can just kind of walk through that get a little bit of a sense of deal structure, understand more of you know what to look for, some terminology, things of that nature, just to help them wrap their head around either A, raising capital for deals they're doing or being a passive investor in someone else's deal. So that's available. If anybody wants to check that out, you can go to casmancapital.com slash sample deal. But just try to get clear on what your goals are, what your objectives are. I'll tell you one mistake I made early on was on that three unit I got a quote to paint a unit during a unit turn. And it was just crazy. I was like $1,000. And I was like, Bitch, I ain't paying $1,000 to paint this unit. I'll do it myself. Well, two coats of paint, a coat of primer, about 1,000 square foot, about 1,300 square foot apartment. It took me all day. <laughs> so from like 9 a.m. to about 6, while I'm literally waiting for paint to dry so I could do the next coat, I called my wife. And she's at the park with my son. Our son was like three months old at the time. And summer, and I'm here in this hot apartment waiting for paint to dry so I could do another coat. And she's at the park with my three-month-old son. And we tell ourselves that I'm doing this for my family. I'm doing this for generational wealth. I'm doing this for more financial freedom, for time flexibility. Yet on this weekend day, I'm sitting in this hot-ass apartment waiting on paint to dry while my family's at the park. And it made me realize that sometimes, you know, we get into things for one reason, but when you're in it, you're actually not making the decisions based on what you said and your priorities aren't really your priorities. And it was clear to me that saving money that day was my priority and not spending time with my family. And that was the last time I painted a unit because it's like, you know what? No, like, yes, I could have done it myself and I did save money, but at what cost? You know, how many weekends do you get with, you know, an infant child where neither of you are working? It's summer, it's warm, especially when you're in Chicago. So I had to just really stop and process like, hey, we got to change our decision-making process and not be so worried about the dollars we're making or dollars we're spending because the whole reason we bought this investment was to give us time flexibility. So to spend all that time back in the business is really a mistake. And I just say that because so many people invest in real estate looking for passive income and they really get a second job. So if you don't want a second job, think about how you're going to invest and make sure it truly is passive versus signing up for something where now you're showing units on a weekend, you're painting, you're doing tours, you're fixing stuff. If that's not what you really want to do, don't do it. It makes your investing strategy allows you that flexibility you're looking for. I would encourage our listeners to rewind about a minute and go back and listen to that one more time because that's very, very awesome advice because it sounds like you and your wife discussed your why and you know, you had that conversation beforehand. And then all of a sudden, like you said, you were making decisions that, you know, didn't directly go against your why, but didn't align a hundred percent with your purpose and your why for this journey that you guys decided to go on. And I think that's very, very awesome advice that John just shared. So highly encourage you to go back and listen to that one more time, just to really let that sink in because that's the truth. You know, like you said, you don't get many opportunities to go to the park with your wife on a sunny Saturday with a three month old son. It would suck to make decisions continually like that. So they stack up and then all of a sudden, you know, you're missing more weekends, you're missing more time with your family. And, you know, that's why everyone gets into this is to free up some time and control their financial future. So I think that was really powerful. We will definitely make sure to link the sample deal in the show notes so everyone can go check that out. John, is there any additional places that you'd like people to learn more about you or connect with you? 
No, you can go to LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. If you love podcasts, we've got a show called Multifamily Insights. So check us out there wherever you're listening to this podcast. But no, I appreciate the time today and thank you for having me on. Thank you so much, John. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Real Estate Professionals Investing Podcast on WIN, your community of investing knowledge for growth. We hope that this episode has increased your knowledge and added value to your path to freedom. If you would, please take a second to rate us so that we can get more great investors to interview. If you or someone that you know wants to be on, please visit westsideinvestors.com and fill out our form to be on the show. Thank you again and enjoy your day.